Hi, this is Val Hart, the real Dr. Doolittle, and today I'm talking with Vaughn Wilson. Vaughn Wilson is an accomplished artist, photographer, musician, writer, and horseman. He's recognized as one of the foremost portrait artists in the southwest of the United States. With over 38 years of experience, Vaughn's work can be seen all over the country in places such as the Pro Rodeo Hall of Fame in Colorado Springs, Colorado, the National Cowgirl Hall of Fame and Museum in Fort Worth, Texas, the Musicians Hall of Fame, and the Texas Cowboy Hall of Fame in Fort Worth, Texas. Recently, Vaughn launched his book. It's called Tell Me About That Horse, Stories from Exceptional People About Treasured Horses. Relationships are an important part of life, and they shape the path that we take. For Vaughn Wilson, there is no comparison to a relationship between horses and their owners, and I heartily agree. His beautiful book is a work of art and captures the essence of the remarkable horses that have inspired, encouraged, and entertained their caretakers. Tell me about that horse, stories from exceptional people about treasured horses, is a compilation of 40 intimate profiles of devoted horse lovers and the horses that have influenced their lives. Tell Me About That Horse is a beautiful tribute to cherished horses that have inspired, encouraged, and entertained us. Along with the stunning art and photography of Wilson, it also tells the stories of people such as Charlie Daniels, Roy Rogers Jr., Michael Martin Murphy, and Red Stiegel, along with a foreword written by Nolan Ryan that I promise you will leave you captivated. Daryl Dodds, the publisher of Western Horseman Magazine, said, Vaughn Wilson is a passionate horseman and skilled photographer. He's a talented painter and the type of interviewer who just doesn't get in the way of a good story. And if you like horses and horse people, you're going to love this book. You can find out more at his website. It's www.tellmeaboutthathorse.com. One more time, tellmeaboutthathorse.com. Welcome, Vaughn. Well, thank you, Val. I'm glad to be with you and your audience today. I'm delighted. You have created an exceptional book. It is absolutely gorgeous. I'm looking at it. It won the Will Rogers Medallion Award. So what in the world inspired you to do this work? Oh, Val, you know, it's funny. I'm one of those lucky people, I guess, that's been fortunate to spend most of my life in the company of horses. I've just loved horses all my life. In fact, they tell me my first word was horse. (laughs) <laughs> and so I just came here needing to be around horses. And um, I've been a breeder for about 35 years. Uh, we breed Appaloosa Rainin horses. Oh. And looking back over all those years and all those horses, I can think of one or two that were so special for, you know, whatever reason. It was something intangible. Yeah. You know, not necessarily my, my best bred horse or, or the most beautiful horse on the place, but just something special about that one particular animal. And I just got to wondering if um, other horse people felt that same way, so I decided to ask some of them, and the stories I got were just incredible. And that's what led to tell me about that horse. Wow. Okay. So so what do you think people need to know about horses? What, What is it that inspires us, that touches us? What makes them so remarkable? and so critically important to our lives? Well, horses are, are, are magic. They're just magical creatures. People see them, and, you know, they, they love them from afar. There are people like me who have to be around them, you know, that have been around them all their lives. They work with them. They, uh, they train them, uh, or they just ride them, whatever. And then there's another segment of the population out there that, you know, they might live in an apartment in New York City. And they'll never have the opportunity to own a horse, but they love the idea of horses, yeah. and that's pretty special. It is special, isn't it? Yeah. So. Yeah, and and the other thing about horses that uh, I think most people don't take into consideration. I, I go out and I speak to a lot of groups and uh, you know talk about uh, horse rescue and that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, people have a tendency to equate horses with dogs because a lot of people who love horses also love dogs and I've been asked you know how do you equate uh, the feelings of a horse and the feelings of a dog and I said well you can't they're two entirely different animals Uh, uh, like I say most people don't realize that horses are prey animals Mm -hmm. dogs are predators we are predators the fact that a horse trusts us 
is always up to him, never to us. Ah. And I think that's remarkable because when you get a horse to do what you want him to do or to, to join up with you and, and, and become a partner with you, it has to be his choice every time. Yes. I think that is what makes it so incredible when you see a horse and you experience their choice. It is totally their decision to connect with you, to join Absolutely. up. Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it's like they give themselves into your hands. They're now following your lead, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hopefully. <laughs> or, or you're following theirs, whoever's dancing to whoever's tune, right? Well, you know what's uh, funny, too, Val, is that, uh, you know, you go out, if you have a horse out in the pasture and, and you go out to get that horse, you, you have a bridle in your hand, you go out there, our tendency is to want to walk directly up to the horse, get the horse, walk out of the pasture. That's totally against the horse's nature. <laughs> and when he runs off from you, even if he's a well-trained horse, you know, you have a tendency to say, well, he's crazy. Something wrong with that horse. Mm -hmm. No, there's nothing wrong with that horse. <laughs> no. That's what they do. That's what they're yeah. ingrained to do. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So I, I, that when you said that, I'm just, I have such a strong memory of one of my most favorite horses in my life. His name was Taylor. He was a Russian Arabian, and he lived at Liberty in about a 30-acre pasture with uh, lots of herd mates and, mm -hmm. you know, all over the place. And, and when, we, when I would go out there, you know, number one, he would know I was coming. And number yeah. two, when I'd go out, you know, when I'd head to the gate, you know, and call him, um, I, it would just take a, a minute or so, and I would hear the thunder of horse hooves you know, and hear the whole bunch of them come barreling up, you know, racing through the the trees and yeah. jumping over the whatever, you know, the, it was just, it was such a magical moment because he would so clearly choose and be so delighted to come play, you know, to connect and to right. whatever we were going to do was okay with him. Um, but it, it was totally his choice. And if you know how it is, if you're going to try to track a horse and catch one in 30 acres <laughs> might yeah. be an impossible project uh, if they're not willing. So, right. you know, it, I always tell my clients and people, if, if your horse it doesn't love being with you and isn't, you know, looking forward to playing with you, then something's wrong with the relationship. And like you said, if, if you're going out toward them and to catch them in the pasture and you're going out, you know, face forward, barreling ahead like the predators mm -hmm. that we are, um, then their nature is to flee, you know, sure. get the heck out of here. So that's a really good point. Yeah. Well, it's like if, if we see a bucket sitting on the ground mm -hmm. and we want that bucket, we go straight to the bucket, pick it up, and walk off with it. Mm -hmm. If a horse one. sees a bucket on the ground, he approaches it slowly, he walks around it, he looks at it from different angles, mm -hmm. and then he walks up to it. It's a whole different mindset. Yes, it is. Yeah. I love that. That's a really good point, Vaughn. Thanks. So um, so tell us about some of the stories. I know you've talked to uh, rodeo performers, ranchers who make their living with horses. Um, you've got all kinds of people in here. You've got uh, Roy Rogers, uh, Jr., you've got Michael Martin Murphy. Oh, my God. You know, Tell us some about some of the stories and what you learned when you were making the book. Oh, gosh. It, it was such an interesting experience. Uh, I got to meet so many wonderful people that I never thought I'd have a chance to meet and mm -hmm. and do some things that I, I never thought I'd get a chance to do, you know. And, um, uh, you know, sitting around with people like uh, Charlie Daniels, uh, you know, just me and Charlie sitting at a kitchen table, you know, just talking, two guys talking about horses. Yeah. One of the things that most people ask me first is what's it like to sit around with Charlie Daniels? And I have to tell them that, you know, it's just like me and anybody else. We're just yeah. talking about horses, two guys yeah. talking about horses. Yeah. And I will admit, though, that after a while, we drifted off and started talking about music. Mm -hmm. And we started talking about songwriting. And then all of a sudden it came back to me, oh, this is Charlie Daniel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, I forgot. <laughs> oh, yeah, I forgot what I was talking to here. Uh, but but it's always like that. Every time I would come in from the road, this took me three years. I traveled about 40,000 miles over a three-year period gathering, wow. these, gathering these interviews and these photographs for this book. And every time I would come back in, my wife would say, did you get a picture made with so-and-so, whoever you were with at this mm -hmm. time? And I said, no. 
nobody there but the, the two of us, nobody yeah. to, to get a photograph, you know. Yeah. Of yeah. course, I had a camera. I was photographing these people right. for the book, but um, <laughs> very seldom was there ever anybody there. Uh, Michael Martin Murphy, I, I spent about three days with him up in Iowa, mm -hmm. and uh, by the time we got around to actually doing the interview, it was just uh, Murph and, and me sitting on the back of uh, the tailgate of my pickup truck. Mm -hmm. There was nobody else around, you know. Yeah. Everybody else had, had left by then. Yeah. So that was uh, pretty much the way it always was. I love that. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that's really interesting, too, because so many people, you know, they think of celebrities and people – Extraordinary people, you know, mm -hmm. in, in as far as they've made their mark, you know, in the yeah. world. They've shared their message. They've shared their heart. Uh, they've had a mission, a purpose. Something has put them in the public eye. Right. But, well, know, here's they, the thing. I mean, no matter who they are, they're horse people. Exactly. If I had gone to Charlie yeah. Daniels and asked him to give me an interview about music, mm -hmm. he probably wouldn't have. Uh, yeah. Same thing with Michael Martin Murphy. Same yeah. thing with some of these other people. Yeah. Uh, but horse people like to talk about horses. <laughs> and so that was the common denominator. That's what got my foot in the door everywhere I went, whether I was talking to uh, uh, world champion cowboy Larry Mahan or, or uh, you know, Nolan Ryan, whoever. They just wanted to talk about horses. And the thing I found out was that they would have so much fun with this project, they would put me onto their friends. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. so that's, that's the way I got some of the interviews. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, so, well, the, the so, Roy Roy Cooper is uh, one of the greatest ropers of all time, eight-time world champion. Wow. <clears throat> and he, he's actually the one that got me with Charlie Daniels because Charlie idolizes Roy Cooper. Mm. And Roy told him, he said, hey, Charlie, i got this friend doing this book, and he told Charlie all about the book. Charlie says, yeah, I'd like to do that. Get him to call me. <laughs> so you know, just one thing leads to another, and yeah. uh, yeah. it's just a lot of fun. So did you actually start out thinking you wanted to interview 40 people, or was it just like a snowball that just kept ever ever drawing you onward? Well, I don't know if I ever had an idea of uh, how many people mm -hmm. I would need for the book or or even how long it would take or, you know, how dedicated I would have to be to this project. This, this was a tough project. And yeah. one thing I like to tell people is that, if you have a dream, it doesn't matter what it is. If it's writing a book, if it's writing a song, if it's getting up in front of people and singing or if it's speaking, it doesn't matter what it is, you've got to start to finish. Yeah. And if you listen to people who tell you that can't be done mm -hmm. or if you listen to people who tell you you're not the guy to do it, mm -hmm. then you won't do it. No. But you have to understand, too, that they can't see your dream. That's a good you know, point. You have to follow your own dream. And... Um, so, so that's uh, you know this this would have been a, a, a an extremely easy project to quit at any point mm -hmm. because it was tough. Um, I, the the funny story about how I got started with it is I I got to thinking about uh, like I told you about asking other people about this special horse, yeah. and I told my wife about it and she's my worst critic. You know she <laughs> she. she uh, <laughs> shoots me out of the saddle on a daily basis. Oh, very good. But, good uh, job. Mm -hmm. Good I job. I told her, I said, yeah. I said if, if I could get enough people to tell me about a special horse, I bet it would make a great book. And one day I, I just sat down and I made out a wish list mm -hmm. of people I'd like to talk to. Mm -hmm. And I brought it into her office and I showed it to her. And she just put down what she was doing and she looked at me like only a wife can look at you. Mm -hmm. And she said, you're never going to do this. Mm -hmm. And I said, what do you mean? She said, well, all you're going to do is talk about it. And she said, besides, you don't like to travel, and those people are not going to come to Petal, Mississippi and sit on our porch and tell you about their horse. <laughs> so I took that as a challenge. <laughs> oh, thank you, Valerie. <laughs> and that's how it started. Yeah, my Valerie. <laughs> your Valerie, what a, what a dear. Yes, so she knew exactly what to say to put the burr under your skin. Yeah, yeah, it was out. a challenge. And, and yeah. And she got me started. and. And so what I did is I took it one step at a time. I knew the rodeo was coming to town the next week. And um, there's a, a very famous rodeo clown. He's a member of the uh, Pro Rodeo Hall of Fame now. And uh, his name's Liesl Harris. And uh, I said, if I can get Liesl Harris to talk to me, that'll be a good starting point. Yep. And um, so I called a friend of mine that I knew was a friend of Liesl's and asked him if he would help me get in touch with him. And he gave him a call, told him what I was doing. And Liesl said, yes, call me right now. Cool. Woo. 
so we got together the next week. Now, there was one catch to that. Liesl's not a horseman. Uh-huh, okay. He wanted to talk about his mule. <laughs> so so this, this great idea I had to write a book about special horses uh-huh. started with the story of a rodeo mule. I love that. <laughs> and it's a great story. And, and Lisa and I have become wonderful friends. We've done some book signings together, and oh, he's just a great guy. Yeah, that's so cool. Oh, man. So, uh, oh, I just, I, it's like I want to hear all of the stories. Um, tell me about Ray, Ro- uh, I'm sorry, Ro- uh, I can't even say that. Roy Rogers Jr. I'm stuttering this morning. Tell me well, about Roy Rogers Jr. So- yeah, Roy, Roy Rogers Sr., of course, uh, Leonard Slough was his original mm-hmm. name, and he changed it to Roy Rogers when he got in the movies. Oh, okay. Um, but he, um, he was always my hero. From the time I was growing up, uh, he was, in fact, there was a time when I thought I was Roy Rogers. Oh, that's fun. You were chilling. Um, okay. So uh, I, he was just my idol. And, you know, the the chance to be able to sit down with Roy Rogers, Jr., of course, I never met Roy. and uh, But but the chance to sit down with Roy, Jr., who they called Dusty, uh, was just a, like a dream come true. I mean, I got to sit and talk about his dad and talk about uh, Roy's famous horse, Trigger. Yeah. And, you know, that was just something really, really special. And I told Dusty, I said, you know, I said, I never got to meet your dad. I said, but I loved him all my life, still watch his movies to this day. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, you know, sometimes when you get to meet one of your heroes, it's not always like you think it'll be. Maybe they let you down a little bit, and he just shook his head and laughed. He said, not my dad. Mm -hmm. He said, you would have loved him. He said, he was exactly the person that you saw on that silver screen. Wow. He said, that's who Roy Rogers was. Wow. So he wasn't acting or playing a part. He was being himself. Yeah, yeah. Oh. And another funny story about Roy Rogers. And, and uh, when Michael Martin Murphy, you know, he was a pop singer. He had the song Wildfire back in the 70s and mm-hmm. mm-hmm. <clears throat> did a lot of pop songs. And then he made a decision that he was going to become a cowboy singer. He was going to dedicate himself just to cowboy music. And today, of course, he's the biggest selling cowboy singer in America. Wow. But when he first started, he went to Roy Rogers and he told him, Roy, he said, I want to do this cowboy music. He said, Do you have any advice for me? And Roy thought a minute and he said, Michael, I do. He said, I've got two pieces of advice for you. He said, Number one, never say or do anything that will lead a kid down the wrong path. He said, number two is get yourself a good-looking horse because you're going to get old and ugly. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was classy. Oh, I love that. So it's not, yeah. not a good woman. It's it's a good horse. Yeah, yeah. I love that. And, oh, I have a funny story to tell you about Michael Martin Murphy. Okay. I used to babysit for him. Really? <clears throat> the, uh, he and his wife and a uh, little boy lived. Right down below us, outside, uh-huh. uh, we, were, we lived off of Lake Travis, outside of Austin, Texas, uh-huh. and I used to be his babysitter, so he would go and do his concerts and stuff. It was in the 70s. <clears throat> anyway, it was it was funny. Yeah. Good. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, I remember remember what a nice man he was. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yep. Always. Yeah. I'm delighted as it has its, at what he's done with his life. Yeah, and of course, I used him on the cover of the book. Um that is a, a painting I did of him with his horse Wildfire, and, and he told me that he said, you know, for for years after he had that song uh, hit with Wildfire, he said people would ask him, you know, what did Wildfire look like? Mm-hmm. And he said he never wanted to have a horse or, or to give anybody an idea of one particular horse. He wanted it to be in everybody's imagination what yeah. Wildfire looked like. Yeah. He said, but when he found this particular mare, she's a, a quarter horse palomino Mm -hmm. and uh, he said he saw her she's a a reigning horse and he said that's my wildfire Mm -hmm. and so this is the only horse he's ever named that and he said when she's gone he said he'll never name another one Mm -hmm. wildfire and he won't try to replace her he'll find a totally different horse yeah it's almost like he had the the spirit of her long before he actually met her and when he met her he, he recognized her absolutely yeah. And the the image that I decided to use for the painting, you know, uh, 
I, I wanted him looking at the horse and the horse looking at him. And I told him one time, I said, you know, that's, that to me says everything about what this book is about. It's the trust and the bond between a horse and a man. And uh, then, of course, he used that image uh, as his cover for Buckaroo Bluegrass. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Congratulations. Yeah, he used that. And then he used another one of my photographs for uh, Buckaroo Bluegrass, too. Wow. <laughs> Congratulations. Well, thank you. Woo. Um, okay, let's switch here just a little bit. You mentioned Trigger a little bit ago. Mm -hmm. and of course, I grew up with the amazing Trigger. Um, can you tell us something interesting about Trigger that, that most people may not know? Well, uh, Trigger was a stallion. I don't okay. know if a lot of people know that. Um, stallions are totally different animals. People mm -hmm. have this this vision in their minds or something of the beautiful white stallion and I've had kids tell me, oh, I would love to have a stallion that I can ride. No, you don't. Mm -hmm. No, no, you don't want that mm -hmm. because they're totally different animals. They're not normal horses. Mm -hmm. um, if you have a great stallion like I do, I, I've got one of the best. He's a two-time world champion and just the sweetest guy on earth. But there are certain times of the year mm -hmm. when you don't want to turn your back on him. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because a stallion will always try you, mm -hmm. and he'll try you today, and he'll try you again tomorrow doing the same thing, and he'll say, oh, you don't want me to do that today? I thought that was yesterday. Mm -hmm. Yeah, today's a new day. Yeah, and a stallion, uh, the relationship between you and a stallion is that one of you has to be the boss, and he always wants it to be him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's his nature. Yeah, so, yeah, it, you know, people don't understand that, and... But Trigger, on the other hand, was such an unusual horse because he was a stag in his whole life. And Roy could take him up in hospitals, mm. um, take him up elevators. Uh, Dusty told me that as kids they would crawl all over him, uh, crawl under him, and they said they never had a fear that that horse would harm him in any way. Wow. Another interesting thing about Trigger that I don't know if a lot of people know this or not, but... Uh, when when Roy first got him, he was a movie horse already. Okay. And uh, his name was Golden Cloud. Oh, okay. And he had been in the uh, Robin Hood movie with Errol Flynn. Oh, wow. And Olivia de Havilland. It was her horse in, in uh, Robin Hood. And uh, if you go back and look at the old black and white version of uh, Robin Hood with Errol Flynn, you'll see Olivia de Havilland riding Trigger. Oh, my God. That's great. Yeah. Ah, I love that. Mm -hmm. he, so he was a professional actor. Yeah. Uh, his in his own right, and then yeah, he, he was an actor horse. And when Roy made his first movie in 1938, mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. it was uh, a, a, called Under Western Stars, and uh, his co-star was Smiley Burnett, who had been Gene Autry's sidekick in all of his movies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, they brought in some horses for Roy to look at. They said, "You're going to need your own horse." And uh, so he, he saw that Palomino, he got on him, rode him down to the end of the road, came back, and he said he didn't even try out another one. But he yeah. said when he got back off, he, he turned to Smiley, and he said, uh, man, you know, he said he got down there and turned on a dime and gave me change. <laughs> and, uh, and Smiley said, Roy, that horse is pretty quick on the trigger. Mm -hmm. And he said, yep, that's what I'm going to call him, Trigger. Oh, well, I love that. That's how he got named Trigger. Yeah. What a great story. Thanks for sharing that. Wow. Oh, this is just it just makes my heart smile. I just this is such a such fun. Oh, God, I love yep. it. All right. So, oh, goodness. Um what else can we ask you? I've got so many things to, <laughs> to ask. Um so, you know, I I know that the book is going to be a good read for most anybody who likes a good story. Um but can you think of anyone specifically that you might want uh, to to mention? Uh, oh, gosh, there's so many great stories in there. Uh, one of my favorites, I guess, is uh, a lady named Pam Grace Fowler. I'm, I'm sorry, Pam Fowler Grace. I okay. <laughs> uh, and she's just a, a wonderful woman, a, a sweet, sweet person. Uh, I just spent some time with her and her husband out in Houston. And... Um, she has a, an intriguing story that I was aware of before I actually met her, but uh, 
she has a horse, a, a big Appaloosa leopard that uh, she had trained for dressage. She's mm -hmm. a dressage trainer, mm -hmm. and she had actually won some huge dressage uh, championships all over the world with this horse. And mm -hmm. she said she had to get past the fact that this is a big spotted horse. She said, that's all the judges saw at first, you know, is that this was uh, not what they normally see. No, not but your he usual so trick yeah. mm -hmm. He was so talented, finally they got around to uh, uh, awarding her, you know, what she deserved, and she won wow. several world championships. But one day she started getting calls on the phone from different people around the country asking about that horse, mm -hmm. and she couldn't understand why they were doing this. And after about four or five of these calls, a lady called her and identified herself as Paul McCartney's personal secretary. Oh, my God. And she said, Mr. McCartney would like to talk to you. And so she uh, she said, well, okay, have him call me. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he called her, and uh, this was uh, not long after his wife, Linda, had died. Mm -hmm. And he wanted to fly her and her horse to New York City and have them come down the center aisle of the cathedral at Linda McCartney's memorial service. Oh, my God. Yeah, it's just an incredible story, and, and, and to hear her tell it, you know, it's, of course, she gets very emotional every time she tells it. I bet. It's great. Oh, oh my gosh. We might need to stop a minute. This phone's dying. Oh, okay, hold on. Let me grab another phone real quick. Could you hear that beep? Uh, no, we're okay. I guess it's on my end. Yeah, you're okay. Let me let me get this other one on. Are you there? I am. Okay. I heard another beep. Was is that I me? Think I, I think I heard that one too. Okay. Have you maybe, maybe it's switched over? Key. Okay. All right. I'm <laughs> ready to continue. No. Okay. That's fine. So uh, let's see, where were we? We're talking about Linda McCartney. We're talking about, uh, yeah, the Linda Memorial. McCartney thing, and I was basically through with that because uh, okay. that, that whole story is in the book. Oh, oh, okay, one second. Finish up with that part. Just say that the whole story is in the book. So hold on one second. Wow, Vaughn, that's such an amazing story. Yeah, it's a great story, and, and like I say, she's uh, – she gets very emotional telling it, uh, but the whole story is in the book. It's, uh, it's just uh, an amazing story. Wow. I, I would love to see pictures of that big Appaloosa horse prancing down the middle of the memorial service. Yeah, and it was uh, they, they kept it a secret from everybody. Uh, oh. Nobody knew that it was going to happen except Paul McCartney, and he was standing up uh, you know, at the front of the cathedral, mm -hmm. and he was the only one that could see her come in to the church, wow. and she did this, uh, I forget what it's called, uh, Spanish walk, I think, down mm -hmm. the center aisle of this cathedral with thousands of people in there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. Oh, so I, I'm just I'm, I'm curious, um, what was it about the big spotted horse and her being in that service? What, what was it? Uh, was, it was Linda a uh, horse Linda was, or? Uh, yeah, she had a leopard Appaloosa. Oh, and she did. That was the love of her life. And, oh, my God. Uh, and the story goes, uh, well, it's, it's the true story, is that when she actually passed away, Paul was sitting there holding her hand, and he was telling her, uh, just picture yourself riding across the hills on your big Appaloosa. Oh, oh that just makes me cry. Yeah. Oh, how beautiful. Mm, thanks. Great story. Mm. Oh, goodness. <sighs> All right. So there are stories in this book that are going to make people laugh and make them cry, as that one just did me. Um, <laughs> Good. I'm doing my job. <laughs> ah, excuse me while I blow my nose it, right in the middle of the microphone. Okay, I'm just going to sniff. Oh, so Anyway, the, so the book was actually released in November of 2010, and you've been doing a lot of touring, book signings, things like that? Uh, yeah, we've, we've done quite a few. Uh, okay. Don't do a lot of book signings, uh, okay. but on occasion, like I say, I was out in Houston a couple of weeks ago with Pam, and uh, that's what we were doing out there for three days at a big Western store. We were uh, signing books. Ah, okay. Okay. Awesome. 
Okay, so, and by the way, hey, I heard that you were recently singing for children. What was that all about? <laughs> yeah, as recently as yesterday, <laughs> I sang for for 600 first and second graders. Whoa! Um, I do this program called Kid Folk. Okay. Uh, I have a CD of old classic folk songs for children. Cool. I did several years ago, and uh, okay. it's called Kid Folk. And so we just call the program Kid Folk. And what we're trying to do, Val, is we're, we're of course, wanting to familiarize kids with these old songs that I grew up on, you know, songs mm-hmm. like uh, Old Dan Tucker and uh, mm-hmm. Crawdad Song and um, Huff the Magic Dragon. Oh, uh, my favorite. Know, those types of yeah. songs. Yeah. Um, kids don't get a chance to hear those anymore. So what we do is we have a, a lesson plan that goes out to a school, and uh, the teacher will teach these kids a week of classic folk music uh-huh. using this CD and uh, using the lesson plan. Mm-hmm. And um, by the time I get there for the performance, mm-hmm. they know all the songs. Oh, it's wonderful. And they're just, they eat it up. They love these songs. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I go in and perform the songs for them, and they sing along and clap along, and it's it's incredible. Oh, I love that. But what I love... A, yeah, it's, it's just a form of teaching mm-hmm. through doing. You know, yeah. you get up there and you show kids the arts. You show them, I'm up there with a guitar, and I dress up as a character that we call Uncle Hokum. Uncle Hokum. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's funny. Go to the website. You'll see it. Okay. <laughs> uh, but, okay. uh, you know, you go in, and, and when I walked in that room yesterday, it just went crazy. Mm-hmm. I mean, the kids just went nuts when I walked in there. And uh, and then the fact that they they know the songs and they're loving the songs and they're singing along, yeah. it's just an incredible experience. Oh, wow. Oh, I love this so much. And I, what, I also love what you brought in, which is to – inspire our, our children to the arts, right. you know, and to give them the history of where these wonderful songs came from that made us, you know, helped make us who we are today. That's correct. Um, I mean, you, you know, go back and you look yeah. at songs like Oh, Susanna, yeah. and uh, uh, even songs like, some people are not familiar with the song Goober Peas, but it's an old Civil War song. It's a funny story about uh-huh. how the soldiers ate boiled peanuts. They carried them with them and ate boiled peanuts as they marched. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Uh, have songs like, uh, you know, Coming Around the Mountain, um, mm-hmm. Red River Valley, um, mm-hmm. just uh, uh, the Crawdad song, Froggy Went a Court, and, you know, just songs that, <laughs> that that are classics that go back two and three hundred years. Uh, yeah, the stories, yeah. the folk stories that were put to music, and people would continue writing uh, other verses for them, you know, and they make up their own verses. And, and so we... Yeah. We let the kids do that, you know, encourage them to participate in that. You know, write your own verse to, to coming around the mountain. Let's see how that sounds, you know, and, mm-hmm. and that sort of thing. And it's just a, a form of teaching kids by having them see someone actually do it. Yeah, yeah. And immersing them in the experience of it and using right. music to help them learn. And what I'm thinking, what I'm so struck by is the concept of creating a living history that goes, like you said, two, three hundred years back Absolutely. and brings it into the present through music. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you can't really learn that out of a book. No. You know, it, it's, it's so it's much more effective time. because yeah. of the way we learn. It's yeah. more effective if they see it taking place and they see yeah. the art involved in it. Yeah. So that's what we're trying to do. I love it. Thank you so much for doing that. Our children need that. You know, and, and we older folks, uh, we do too. Like, yeah. It would be hard to imagine a world without art, without, you know, music. And folk songs are what connect us as a people, you Absolutely. know, as a society for who we've become, you know, over mm-hmm. the ages. And sure. and uh, the, the people before us that make made us who we are today. Right. You know, so we want to acknowledge that. Oh, so how can people get a copy of your gorgeous book? The book is available at uh, tellmeaboutthathorse.com. Okay. And if anybody is 
slightly interested, they could get a copy of the Kid Folk CD at kidfolk.net. Great. So let me repeat. K-I-D-F-O-L-K dot net. Great. Let me repeat it uh, just to be sure people can get that. Uh, so the, the Kids Folk Songs is mm -hmm. kidfolk.net, K-I-D-F-O-L-K dot N-E-T. Mm -hmm. And your book is available. I know it's through Amazon, um, but it's also on your website at tellmeaboutthathorse.com. And you said something about autographing copies. Yeah, if they go through the website, okay. tell me about that horse dot com, then mm -hmm. we can uh, give them a personal uh, uh, autograph, and also the same thing with the uh, the kid folk, and and both okay. the book and the kid folk are available on Amazon dot com if they prefer that. But I can't do the autograph thing there. Mm -hmm. I understand. Yeah. Oh, good. Oh, okay. So thank you, Vaughn. Uh, thank you for sharing your love of horses with us. Thank you for loving horses, and thank you for doing everything that you do to continue their message and their history and their um, their magic. Well, thank you for life. allowing me to share that with your audience. Uh, it's it's a passion of mine, um, and uh, you know I love sharing it. And just like these people that I interviewed, everybody wanted to talk about their horses, and yeah. I just got some of the most incredible stories from these people. And in every case, I would tell them, I don't necessarily want to hear about your most famous or your most valuable horse. Mm -hmm. yeah. I want to hear about the one that stirs a little emotion in you when you think about them. And that's that's yeah. where I got these incredible stories. Yes. Oh, I love that. Yeah. Oh, touches my heart. Thanks, Vaughn. All right. You're very welcome. So we'll finish it up here. Thanks for your time. And we'll look forward to hearing what else you're up to. So Great. thanks. Right. All right. We'll talk to you later. Okay. Thanks, Okay. Ralph. Thanks for listening to the show. For more information or to listen to other podcasts, go to valhart.com forward slash blog. And if you're someone who values a non-invasive, holistic solution to resolving problems with your dogs, cats, and horses, and you want better behaved, healthier, and happier animals, just go to my website at valhart.com to apply for a complimentary Happy Animal Assessment session. And be sure and remember to look for my CDs on iTunes. Learning how to talk with animals is fun and will change your life. So while you're there at my site, get my free Quick Start Animal Talk course and check out the world's first complete animal communication made easy system. May the love of animals bless you, teach you, inspire you, heal you and reconnect you to the circle of life.